Hi, I'm Robert Eggers, the co-writer and director of The Northman. Hello, this is Jaron Blaschke, a cinematographer for The Northman, and uh, this is The Good Creative Show. Hello and welcome to The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. My name is Ben Consoli, and today we speak with Robert Eggers and Jaron Blaschke from The Northman. Guys, welcome back to the show. We're really happy to have you today. Thank you. Glad to be here. First of all, I love this movie. I got to see it kind of during the press screening, which is always a really fun experience because you, no previews, no nothing. They just get right to the point. And the audience in that press screening were just jaws dropped, floored, absolutely loved it. I was among them. I mean, what an interesting and just crazy project to be part of, especially now, like coming out of the pandemic, getting back into the theaters. This is just such an interesting project. But before we get there, I just want to very quickly mention this episode of Go Creative Show is sponsored by Shotlister, the best shot list creation app for production in the business. Email them at gocreativeshow at shotlister.com for your free gift. First of all, congratulations on such a great movie. But I'd like to start with just the changes that you've seen in your careers, both of your careers, since The Witch, since The Lighthouse, and now The Northman. This project, The Northman, had such a significantly bigger budget. And with that, I'm assuming there must have been some just differences in the way that the whole thing functioned. Robert, I'd love to start with you. How did this movie change the way that you became, the, your filmmaking approach? I mean, were, was the budget, did the budget kind of change anything for you? Uh, <clears throat> first of all, thanks for the kind words. Uh, but yeah, you know, I I in some ways, in, in, in many ways, nothing changed. In many ways, nothing changed. In many ways, what was really great about <clears throat> what Regency and Focus did uh, is that they allowed me and my collaborators, like Jaron and Craig Lathrop, the production designer, and Linda Muir, the costume designer, Louise Ford, the editor, you know, th these people who are part of the loyal group of <clears throat> witches and lighthouse keepers, you know, we kind of have been working at a way to make films and they let us do the same thing. Uh, you know, very limited coverage. We took that a lot further. I'm sure we'll talk about it to death. Um, and, and this kind of uh, hysterical accuracy uh, in, a, in a period film. And, uh, and we were just kind of allowed to, to, to do that on a larger scale. Uh, and, and, and we were lucky to be working with a really experienced crew who <clears throat> had worked on Ridley Scott movies and Game of Thrones and <clears throat> you name it. And they, they, they sort of know how to function at this size in a way that we, we didn't. Um, <clears throat> so I think that in, aside from the fact that we had the largest toolbox that you could imagine to work with. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I think, I think in a, in a lot of ways, and, and then we just had to plan even more to, to not fall on our face. Uh, uh, we, it was kind of the same, you know, where things became different really where it was there, there's a lot more VFX and, uh, and, and post-production, was 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 different uh for me because it was longer and more involved and and uh the studio was more involved yeah same question for you jaron i mean what what changed in your cinematography or your approach with this jump in budget and i'm guessing jump in pressure too uh yeah I, i'm very good at compartmentalizing so i don't i don't um I'm, I'm good at hyper-focus, so, you know, it keeps me calm. It's it's kind of a form of denial. It's the only way to get through this. <laughs> uh, and, and, and other things in life, uh, they're, you know, when you come across extremes. So um, I just kind of do that. But, um, yeah, oddly, for me, it was, it was more experimental than the other two movies, weirdly. Because um, it was almost... Uh, the fact that we were there was, was encouragement that... Uh, whatever we're doing is working. So I'm just going to go for broke, you know? So, um, and then I'll, I'll also say that the crew being, uh, of the quality it was, was like just an extension of, uh, for me, my imagination, you know, and, and Rob, yeah. I'm sure. But, um, so I could, you know, I mean, I, there were tests that had a larger crew than, you know, the crew on the lighthouse, you know? So, 
uh, if I really wanted to take ideas I've had for 15 years, you know, that I probably would have played with earlier, but I just, you know, I mean, they're crazy ideas that need resources and time and, and, uh, and large amounts of crew. So, you know, I never felt any constraints. I think there's one, one, uh, studio call Rob where like there's one person in the back of the room that was like, you're going to do what? But other than that, everyone's like, you know, on board, that's my memory of it anyway. So, um, yeah, I feel really fortunate. One of the things I noticed um, just as a viewer is that it seems like you guys are experimenting a lot more with camera motion in The Northman than you did in The Witch and in The Lighthouse too. It seems like, you know, you have a lot, there's big, big giant wonder scenes, the camera's moving a lot, there's a lot of action in the camera. And I'd love to talk to you about that choice, why it was appropriate for The Northman, and also what kind of new experiences did that provide for both of you? <clears throat> yeah, I think I think that uh, the, the 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 first two films are very slow, quiet um, films, and uh, cer certainly, I mean, the lighthouse kind of picks up a bit, but but for the but but certainly in the beginning, that's how it is, and and they are you know more or less uh, art house films, and uh, th this you know was intended for a, a much larger audience, and and it needs to move. Uh, the pace needs to move, and so and so, par and but but without, uh, and so that means for us in, in our way that that the camera's uh, moving. Um, <clears throat> uh, you, hear, you you go for a little, Jaron. I'm sure I'll chime in. Yeah, well, I think I, uh, yeah, I'll do my best in the moment. But um, the yeah, I think the trick was trying to bring the keep the formalism there with the movement. So it was a little bit of a gamble, you know, like you, you board it out and you visualize it for months, you know, and we had the uh, advantage of being able to sit on it for months to sort of mesh these things. And, you know, it comes out of you, but you know, you don't really know until people respond to it. So, um, and it was almost like a, like a puzzle. Like how do we pare this down to its essence? And at the same time you read the script it was like beat after beat after beat. It's like, well, how do you, move, you know, there are moments where, uh, we're even like adjusting beats before or after the other in order to streamline everything visually. Cause it's just a lot more action, a lot more, um, just, yeah, just physical things happening as opposed to people sitting and talking, you know, which is more. Yeah. Yeah. Like, are. Bef like before we can actually, you know, get to the storyboarding, there is sort of a re and this was true to some degree with, the other two films, uh, but there is a certain amount of rewriting that Jaron and I are doing to to as, as Jaron was was, was uh, getting at to like literally reorder some things, you know that like be, be, because because in order for the camera movement to be fluid, we can't go from here to here because the camera is over here. So that be that happened at the end of the scene comes and it comes much earlier. But what's cool is you you're really examining uh, the storytelling and and certainly we would never we never do something just to make the shot work like it's uh, what what comes out of it is 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 something that is more like uh, essential and pure if you know for lack of a better word. I mean, what's what's interesting, at least for me, Rob. I don't know if you also feel this way, but blocking dialogue scenes like with people moving is much easier than people just sitting at a table like that is now the difficult sure. thing. You know? Why, uh, why do you say that? What's easier about it? Well, I couldn't really crack it. Like if you watch a, you know, I'm sorry to say the T word, but if you watch a Tarkovsky movie, like, you know, I, I see it now, but I first, you know, would watch his films. Like you had people moving constantly. I was like, how did you figure this out? But it's like, well, I just need him to get to there and have this moment and then, you know, split them apart and follow this person. Uh, and it just, um, yeah, in a way we have people on their legs so they can, they can kind of go where they need to go as opposed to, no, they are fixed here. They have to sit, you know? So that's, that's kind of the thing we haven't cracked yet. Cause we do have scenes, you know, they're stationary mostly with, uh, sorcerers and seeresses and, you know, where we just kind of go to the shot reverse shot, of course. But, yeah. I, don't, I, I, I personally find that the, having these sorcerer scenes that are shot reverse shot because they're all sort of of a kind. Uh, I, I think it, sure. I think it like th there, that, that formalism works in the context of all these other scenes that are, you know, one to four sure. 
<laughs> long choreographed shots. But 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 I know, yeah. Jaron has said to me that he he, he finds it a little bit uh, un- unsettling. I don't know. You know, I I, I gotta watch the movie. The, again, just the the front. You person. don't like those you, the the unsettling nature of those kind of frontal. You know, right in someone's no, face. I like them, and that's you know, and that's Rob's thing. And you know, we have a, uh, a very strict rules about how to shoot things, and it fits within those rules. And you know, everything's symmetrical. You know, Rob's taste kind of like compositional taste kind of ended at the Renaissance, and that's cool. <laughs> you know what you're doing. You know, like you're gonna put the person right, you know, right smack in front of that long house and use the frame, and it's gonna, you know. And uh, I use that as a compliment, believe it or not. But the um, so it really makes it easy. Uh, to move on to the next thing, you know, how do you, how do you build complexity? Well, that's figured out. And, you know, this is accurate and they would do this. So these are like hard rules. So um, it lets you really tweak, you know, and go upward. And if that makes sense. Yeah. There is an obsession. There, go ahead. No, I mean, the, the lighting constrictions were difficult because um, there are little things that might appear to be windows in some of the structures, but those are really, uh, vents or like ventilation for like uh, agricultural buildings or smoke ventilation, and and there were no windows in 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 Viking Age architecture, uh, which makes Jaren's life difficult. And then and then the, for the night stuff, it's just a, basically a fire in the middle of the room, and also having it be in the center of the room makes our life difficult when we're trying to like. Uh, center frame everything because center frame everything. you have to have yeah. the camera moving through the fire. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is the cruise cost, essentially. But I, yeah. And we're sort of uh, we're circling around the same topic here, but I want to dive a little bit more into this obsession with accuracy that I'm really seeing in all of your films. And it's weird to almost say like accuracy because I think most of the audience is not even going to know if it's accurate or not. But we just kind of have this expectation from your films now where we're watching it and we're like, this is as these two guys know how to make things accurate. <laughs> like I think you just you've carved yourself out to to be the the like we trust you to give us something that is as accurate as possible because we've just read the articles, we've seen the interviews, we know how obsessed you are with it. Does that level of accuracy ever hinder the filmmaking? Or do you think it's always making it better? And Jaron, I'll start with you. Oh, well, I mean, this is more of a Rob topic. You know, I mean, I've, there's no accuracy. I mean, I, I can't, I'm not recreating a, a carving or a tapestry, so. But you are, you are. I mean, we, we yeah, can start with Robert, but you, but his, but the decisions that come from Robert do affect you. So let's start with Robert then. What, do you feel like this, the, your, your interest in making something as accurate as possible, does it ever get in the way of the story you want to tell or does it always help it? Um, it, it look, I mean, you, it's easy to disagree with me, you know, about this. Like I have my opinion. It's easy to dis, to disagree. And I, and I know some people who don't really like my stuff say oh, part of the problem is like, I'm more interested in that stuff than the story. You know, that's not how I see it myself, but, uh, you, you know, so for me, like it always helps. Sometimes it makes things difficult on me, you know, Sean and I will ha- have written something and then the Viking experts say like, that doesn't work because that's not accurate. And we could decide to just keep it the way that it is. Cause it's working fine. Uh, but our decision is like, we have to change it, but we have to f- make sure that it's better or as good as it was before. And sometimes we, it takes a while to figure out what that is. But I think that ultimately, um, ultimately we, we come up with things that are more, more unexpected uh, by sticking to it this way. And I, and I also feel like, you know, as far as, you know, <clears throat> I, I front load all the research and I'm doing all this stuff so that it's all there. And then when I'm on set, like I can focus on the actors. I'm not having to like worry about uh, the, the period details. Cause that stuff's already been sorted. And I think that the other, the other thing is with the work that Jaron and I do, like we're not, 
generally, unless the characters are experiencing it this way, we're not like fetishizing the, the period world. I think like, you know, there's no cutaway shot to how cool like the hunting dogs look or how interesting the musicians are like, they're just sort of like on the periphery, you catch it like as we're going by, but the, you know, but, but the camera is laser focused in like telling the story. Yeah, that's, that's the intention. I mean, I I can sort of relate to it as far as shooting roles go, because, you know, uh, I think the greatest relief for me, uh, even more than like when the shots finally set up is, you know, making the decision. So anything that, that helps make a decision, uh, that's, that's, um, that's the greatest hurdle. Like once you went, like, I think as far as your research goes, like if you just know what it is, you can move on yeah. and go to the next level, you know, same for me, like very strict shooting rules. Like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to tackle the scene. Let's see how a few shots we can do, you know? And that's, that's the greater hurdle than the huge hullabaloo about, you know, uh, accomplishing the shot, you know, which is difficult, but like, you know what it is and as difficult as it is like, Oh, the, you know, the crane's breaking down or whatever. It's like, no, we're going to, we're going to stick to it. We're going to, you know, this is what it is. And there's no getting confused or getting off track. It's very, it's very focused. And that brings me, uh, great comfort even through all the craziness, you know, cause it's like, Oh, now we have to come up with another plan. We're going to come up with three other shots and what, you know, what are they? It's like, no, we're going to plow through, you know, stubbornly. And that's, uh, that's, that's what we do. What would you say was the most complicated scene or shot in the Northman for you guys and why? And we can start, I guess, with Robert, if you want. Well, the, I, I, it, it was the most complex is obviously the raid of the village. I mean, that's just a fact. Uh, I, I, in, I, I, you know, Jared, I, I don't know if I've talked about this. Would be for me, of course, because the lighting and a lot, bunch of stuff was, quite a quite a thing but yeah uh but that we wouldn't be for you you're saying yeah not not the raid it's sort of, that was pretty simple you know because i know cc's gonna build layers back there and back there back <laughs> yeah. there and we we already figured it out over the last three months like you know here's the line of the camera and that was a very slow process you know uh figuring out on paper and then you sort of estimate like, okay you're probably gonna see this and then you tape it out on location and it's like oh, this building was moving, you know, then you have your grip and he's saying, well, the crane can't quite reach there. So it's like, okay, you can shorten that building or move it over here or whatever, you know, and then all these stages. Um, but as far as like on set. You know, yeah, what, what I was going to, what I was going to say is with the, the, the raid, what took pr- the most amount of planning, like inter part departmental planning yeah. for something very complex and, and, uh, you know, and as Jaren saying, like, constantly readjusting the position of of all the buildings in the village that was built to shoot to be it was built to be raided you know uh and uh and but like actually shooting it was not the hardest thing (laughs) be partially because uh we we knew we knew that it needed to like work and and be this big uh like set piece sequence so it was one of the things that we started planning like the the earliest you know something like like the the vault like you know the volcano summit for example you know jaron had his idea about like how to light it for a long time but we didn't have the location until really right up to when it was gonna be uh and and and, and so so even though that is simpler like it was a lot harder uh, you know um yeah and, well, well i think complexity doesn't necessarily make things difficult I mean, if anything yeah. maybe complexity forces you to prepare more so that when it comes right. time to shoot it yeah for sure yeah i think I, I think for me you know the village i say wasn't as difficult but i guess if you, if you really count all the work over the months yeah it's probably the most difficult but lighting wise is more it's a little you can't visualize lighting as, as easily as you can, like where the camera's going to go, you know? So it's how much, how many lights do I need to balance into this little hole, you know, like say the, uh, the warrior King, you know, the, the burial mound, the giant burial mound where he gets the sword, you know, like I think this light is sealed and it's only coming out this way. And I think it's going to fall off this amount from, you know, from the center to the edge and all this stuff. But you don't really know. So you, you know, you shine those lights and sometimes you, you get a pre-light, you know, you get a pre-light, but it's like, 
you're shooting something else, you got to go check it on a weekend, and it's it's a it's a little less uh, it's a little more on the day, uh, just just due to how complex it is. So um, or it's just so would, so would you say that that, that the 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 undead mound dweller fight was the most complex lighting for you? Uh, I think it was just seeing what you needed to see and also have it feel like it needed to feel was kind of like the main tension there, like getting enough information, but also ostensibly it's moonlight coming through a hole that's 25 feet away like that. You wouldn't see anything there, you know? And I was asking about, Oh, should he have a torch? And it's like, well, kind of loses the mood if he has a torch. It's kind of silver scene. And you know, I got that right away. So, okay. But it's kind of this impossible thing. Like, if he's backlit by this one source, like, how much of his face should you see? Nothing. But you have to. So, you know, that's that's the tricky balance there. So in those instances, Jaron, how are you doing that? Like, what are you using to expose the face enough so that, you know, we can see what's going on, but not so much that it takes us out of the time period? And, and yeah, you did, well, I, I did tests. So, I, you know, I could do that. And we had plenty of prep. So it's like, well, is it, you know is it three and a half stops under? Is it four? Is it four and a half? And, you know, and then you try it with the filter we're using. So it, which makes everything monochrome. Uh, there's actually a ton of light on set. We shot at 40 ASA for those who know what that is. So, wow. you know, uh, yeah, it's a lot. And then it was, so, it was uh, incredibly <laughs> unatmospheric <laughs> to yeah. look at. And the other yeah. thing when Jaron was doing these tests is he realized that like, the the location itself the sets and the costume could not be dark so so the the wood w- w- was like the color was almost white i mean it was like the yeah everything was sort of this yeah crystalline dust color uh and it looked yeah it looks looks incredibly flat you know in, in the night series on the farm if you look there if you're looking at it with your eyes and we shot those at 80 asa you know um looks pretty bad you know, but you, you test and you figure out like how the film sees things at a certain exposure level, and then it falls into place. But that that takes testing. You know, that takes resources. So and how to, yeah, how much fall off? You know, can you permit before it? You know, just looks bad or you know even unprofessional. So you gotta you gotta find all this this stuff. So um, it really was amazing having these resources, and it's just like you're you're learning fundamental photography basics on like such a huge scale you know that difference between four and four and a half stops is the word things fall apart somewhere in there so you got to be on it i'm glad you brought that up because i wanted to talk about this idea of learning on the job kind of for a project like this Mm -hmm. talking to you guys at this point in your career is so interesting to me because having you on for the witch having you on for the lighthouse like we're, we're you're giving our audience such a great insight into the progression of your careers and with each new film comes new learning and new stories I'm curious, for The Northman, had you had any experience doing large action scenes before? Like, what, what were the type, some of the lessons that you learned on this film um, in types of scenes uh, that you never had the opportunity to do before? And Robert, we can start with you. Yeah, no, I mean, <clears throat> uh, Jared and I have talked a lot that if the, the book, What We Learned on The Northman, would be, you know, uh, many, many heavy volumes long uh so so you know uh yeah no I, of course i've never done an action sequence before uh n- never mind like a, a a medieval raid scene but i think uh you know we we just uh again we 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 know what we want uh, we prepare a lot and then we had this fantastic crew and uh, and 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 the the great thing about working with a crew at this extremely high level is they say you know this is how you normally do something like this we've done it a billion times you know and and very often you say that sounds great like let's let's do that but then you know there are were are times when we had, Jared and I say well actually like we're going to do it differently because um, because we're not we're trying to do our own thing, you know? And I think, uh, certainly for better or worse, for worse. <laughs> so, 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 and, and you certainly know, on, uh, just be you and yeah, certainly on the witch, like when we were nobody, when we were like, we want to do something different. People were kind of like, you guys, you know, are little dicks, you know, what do you, what do you, you know? And, and, and here the, 
people are checking out. Some of them, right? <laughs> the the crew this 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 crew so experienced they're able to c- kind of just um, say okay, like you want to do it differently, like let's talk about it, you know. And 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 I mean, I like there's a shot, you know, like so many, v- very much, you know, completely from Jaren's imagination. But when we are in the land of the Bruce, uh, it, it begin it begins with a static uh, landscape establisher. Uh, and, and then you see some boats go by in the river and then the camera dollies through the trees and pans landing on the boat. And then dollies in the boat <laughs> into a close up of Alex and then turns 360. And uh, Jaron pitched that to me. And I said, that sounds great, but it's an impossible shot. So, uh, you know, and, uh, they figured out how to do it. Do you think that... Do you're not trying to figure it out in a week. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, well and, what, was, and was, what was the essence of that shot, Jaron? I mean, were you... Did you kind of know that you might get a little bit of resistance? Did you truly think I, it was an impossible shot or did you feel like there was a way? I I, I, don't, I didn't care. Let's figure it out. <laughs> like, we have months, let's like, uh, damn it, let's figure it out, you know? Like, we're, we're making a $80 million movie. Like, let's go for it, you know? So... I've been waiting for this moment for decades, so let's try it, you know? I mean, I think what's great, you know, I keep going back to the crew because it's in, uh, it's in sharp relief to so many other experiences I had, but, uh, you know, there, there, there are people that are, like, you pitch something like that and it excites them, and that's, that's what you want, and that's, that's kind of like the big change, too, because if, if you try it, you know, you kind of push your ambition on a smaller movie, you know, particularly my very early movies, it's just like people, you know, check out, you know, and that, that that's so common. We get those people that, you know, want to, they're as invested as you is, is the rare thing. So, um, that actually, that surprises me a little bit, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, I have no experience making any movie, small or big. I do commercials, but it, it, it's interesting to me to hear that you guys say that the larger the crew, the more established, the more experienced the crew, the more willing they are to try case, these things. Yeah. It, it seems to me, and obviously I'm wrong, that, like indie crews might be because they don't have this experience might be a little bit more willing to try new wild things because they haven't yet realized that it can't happen in a way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I, well, I, or maybe the experienced crew is like, well, look, I've done this and you know, this is, uh, it, it's just more interesting for them. Cause they kind of, I don't know. I, I, this is my first big move, but, um, <clears throat> but then again, and then, yeah. and then, then again, and we talked about this, you know, I think the, most the, people, the, like human beings are, are afraid to fall on their face, you know? So, you know, if you don't have that, then people are afraid to push themselves generally as a, probably as a species, but yeah. What are you going to say, Rob? Yeah. But, but on the other hand, you know, our crew, uh, you know, the, the, the grip crew in the lighthouse and the art department lighthouse, like w- push yeah. themselves like way beyond a, lo- a lot of the stuff that they had yeah. done and they, it, you know, and they were super game, you know? So, so I think, well, I'm not saying I'm not saying as a as a rule you find these gems, but it's like you know there's like one maybe two people per movie, you know. In my experience, you know, so um, it's kind of more of a mix. Let's take a quick break and talk about creating shot lists for your productions. Now we all do it. But if you're not using ShotLister, you're kind of not doing it the right way. It's going to change everything when you start using ShotLister and bringing them into your productions. And I love these guys. So I wanted to bring Zach Lipovsky on the show to talk about it. He's the founder of ShotLister. Uh, So Zach, welcome to Go Creative Show. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. There's so much to talk about with ShotLister, but obviously this is just an ad, so we can't spend five hours on it. So I, w- I want you to just focus on one thing. Tell our audience one thing about ShotLister that they absolutely need to know. For sure. Well, one of the key things that people email in around from all over the world about is live mode, which is basically ShotLister allows you to build a shot list and it allows you to build a shooting schedule on a shot by shot level and estimate how long that schedule is going to take. But when you're actually shooting, something called live mode happens, where it knows how much work is left and it knows how much work you've done already. And so it can calculate how you're doing. It's constantly redoing the math for you uh, and telling you you're half an hour ahead, you're 20 minutes behind. If you get this shot in the next 
15 minutes, you'll stay on schedule and it glows green if you're doing well and it glows red if you're not doing well. <laughs> and so often on set, people are asking, are we in the green or are we in the red? And it just allows you to have this sort of live feeling rather than a piece of paper where you're crossing out shots and doing math in the margins it basically allows you to have this living tablet if you're you know to see how you're doing and make those changes live which is really 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 helpful when you're in that stressful situation of trying to make your day it's such a game changer and you guys absolutely have to check it out now we're going to make it easy for you because shot listers mobile apps are already free but there's also a Mac OS version and a subscription-based ShotLister Pro that unlocks a whole bunch of pro features that you can learn about at their website. And you get a free gift simply by being a Go Creative Show listener. Send them an email at gocreativeshow at shotlister.com and tell them you want your free gift. You have a choice of two, either the ShotLister for Mac OS or a year of ShotLister Pro. So head over to shotlister.com, check it all out. You'll become obsessed within seconds. I know you will. And then send them an email at gocreativeshow at shotlister.com and tell them, I want my free gift. This is the time to do it. You're gonna, your whole productions are gonna change once you start using ShotLister. Believe me, it is awesome. So Zach, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And congrats on such a successful and amazing app. Thank you. Yeah, it's been really cool. This is actually our 10-year anniversary right now, so it's pretty exciting. And I've only been using it for six <laughs> months. Where have I been? <laughs> Thanks so much for being on. Did you find that having bigger crew, more crew, did you find that process to be more kind of stressful for you guys, or did you enjoy the larger scale? What is frustrating is you can't like change your plans really you know and that and 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 uh, you know the, the 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 way that we scrambled the schedule for our first two films to you know uh to to make sure the weather was right was something you just couldn't you did not have the ability to do uh on on a film this scale because you got all this stuff there and you're at this location this day and with all these people and horses and background performers and stunt guys and we're not gonna they're not that's it uh so so that that is the like bad part about it but again it's like you know we were making a big bigger scale movie and we just needed all this stuff you know uh the it's it like uh, you know people have asked me if i would want to work on this budgetary level again and the answer is like yeah but like most of the stuff that i'm interested in is not is like too esoteric to like get a budget this size you know you know you know so so it's 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 going to be very unlikely uh, that I make another movie this size anytime soon because of that. So, so whatever the next thing is, uh, is certainly going to be, uh, you know, s smaller. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can give one example of what Rob's talking about, which is like the Valkyrie sequence, which is this giant, you know, giant green screen thing. And, uh, I was of the, of the strong opinion that it needs hard light. I mean, she's going, you know, moonlight and that becomes Valhall. So we're in Ireland. There's no hard light that you can depend on. In fact, you can depend on it not having any. So, you know, um, that's easiest to shoot during the day and just do day for night, you know, have the filters made, you know, done. But uh, how do I, it's still daylight that I would then, you know, which I could use a spill light, but I'd have to put it four stops under and then I get to, you know, have a, a source that's whatever, three stops brighter than that. It's not going to happen, you know, over a long span. So we had to shoot at night with these ridiculous, you know, lighting instruments covering hundreds of yards and, you know, these giant, uh, green screens, you know, and, and I lit it for night, even though it was so much more work, you know, but, uh, we're shooting it that day. We're not waiting for a sunny day, you know? Um, yeah. So. Can we talk about the camera and lens package for the Northman, what you chose and why Jaron? Uh, it's film. Um, cause that's what we like subjectively. Uh, there's no, logical there's you know there's no numerical uh whatever there's no numbers behind it it's just you know we like the way it looks um not for resolution or you know whatever bits of color or anything it just looks the way it looks and we like it um and we had a 
So it's 35. We actually tested some large format um, that, you know, they didn't go for. Uh, but, you know, in retrospect, we couldn't get the camera where we uh, needed it to get with the ambition of the shots on 65 millimeter. Yeah. We just, you know, but there's no way. Uh, it was a lovely experience shooting tests on 65. Um, you know, well, I can file that away. But, um, yeah, we had uh, the, the lenses are uh, adapted Primos from Panavision. So, um really common lenses that I just had some tweaks, uh, made. So, uh, the Primos have kind of a spiky aperture. I had it rounded. So, you know, we don't have a lot of trees, but you know, little things are out of focus. Wouldn't go into stars. They go into circles or ovals, uh, just add a little astigmatism. So the highlights glow just a little bit. Um, you know, uh, shot really, yeah, it's pretty clean. We will not shoot a movie this clean again. I don't think so. I think, uh, I think whatever the next thing is, it's going to be, uh, you'll be getting a lot more atmosphere from my end. You know, this is pretty like straightforward, clean, epic. You know, there aren't any photography references. You can't make it look like a painting. There aren't really paintings you can reference. So it's just uh, all of my creative energy went into the um, what the camera's doing, you know, the way it moves, where it is. Um, so shot really slow film because I saw a large format. I was like, ah, oh, you know, so I, I wanted it really clean. Um so we had a, we just had a ton of light, you know, and we we're able to do it again because the the scope. But I mean, the the next years, like I said, were um, bonkers, uh, foot candle wise. What was? Uh, how did you ultimately come to the decision for that clean look um, that you mentioned, Jaron? Robert, did that come from you? Did you guys collaborate on that? Yeah, we just we just talked about it, and I think I think as Jaron said, you know. <laughs> you know, very, very, very. Uh, I think I was more into it than you were. For yeah, sure. for sure, for <laughs> yeah. sure. I'm always. I you know, my, I wish everything was black and white, and you can't see anything um, because <laughs> because well, you, you should have you you heard and seen Rob's references for the lighthouse. By the way, where you you know you, you had some like uh, like bathtub developed uh, references for me for that. I think I, I was one. Pull that back a I think that it's just you know the the more that you see things perfectly, the more you are I'm disappointed in in them. Uh, it, it's I you know I don't want to. Well, you also have you also have Craig, so things will look good. You know, I know, but I well, I think I, I think yeah. that th- this is something I've I've, 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 I've had to uh, do uh, a few uh, like. It's the Nosferatu cen- centennial interviews, um, and 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 something that I've been saying is that the the version of Nosferatu that I saw when I fell in love with Nosferatu as a kid was like a VHS of a bad sixteen millimeter print, um, and the image was it was so degraded that <clears throat> that you know Max Schreck seems like a real vampire like that's how those rumors you know, you know came to be is because the way that people experienced watching that film was was in a very were, were these very degraded images and and now you know thankfully it there, there's been these restorations where we can see more now's intention and it's all very crystal clear but you can see you know the the bald cap line and the grease paint eyebrows and all of the artifice, you know, it, you know, and and the version that I saw as a kid, uh, you know, had more magic because of the things that you couldn't see, to me, subjectively. Um, but yeah, but basically, we, when we are, that's why I like to not see things. Okay, so then. Then with, with, with the Northman, you know, gen- generally we're looking at paintings and artwork from the period to kind of, uh, or photographs or whatever, um, to kind of point us in the right direction. But, uh, Viking age, um, visual arts is incredibly stylized. Uh, there is a kind of like formality to it that we were able to think, you know, uh, that, that we, that, that works for our tastes, but I and but I think uh, and there and there are some sequences that are inspired by Viking Age art uh, to it to a degree. But you, it's certainly not atmospheric and it's certainly not photographic. And and I think like where the atmosphere was going to come from is the is the locations uh, and the literal atmosphere like uh, of like you know, well a fog machine, but like but rain and. Uh, 
<clears throat> and snow and fire and ice and so uh, you know having it just having it just be make you feel like you're there uh or, or the attempt to do that seemed to make m- m- make sense so we've got a lot of questions from our audience um about shooting day for night and why and when and how you make those decisions people and you know listeners to this show are clearly obsessed with your decision to shoot at night and um there's questions about uh, lighting with the bonfires. There's questions from Justin uh, Urowski asking, how do you manage and prep all night work and decide which is day for night and which is uh, which is night for day and day for night? So people want to know about your decisions to shoot day for night and why, and then also how you set those types of scenes up. Which of you guys want to pick that Jaren. one? I want to start with you, Jaron, on that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm someone who hasn't cracked, uh, how, hasn't cracked soft light as a night, uh, as a quality of light for night. So, uh, I don't buy it, you know, even when, like, even our foggy scenes, I'm using sharp light, which doesn't make any sense, but for some reason it just reads as night to me better. Everything's just sort of even and dim. I don't really, it doesn't feel like night to me, even though it's logical, you go out in a cloudy night, you know, that's what it looks like. Um, but, uh, also I think you, you can, you can have, you can let it go dark when you have contrast, right? If you don't see oh, something, I, well, no, no, I'm just going to push pause. Oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to push, push pause real quick and then you continue. But just basically we all, we shot almost no day, day for night, even though it like looks like day for night a lot of the time. Uh, like, uh, the, uh, we, we, I don't know if I should take that as a compliment or not. (laughs) (laughs) We, 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 like there were background plates of the locations that were sometimes shot day for night, uh, to, to like have a deeper, deeper background. Uh, and then the night and then the, and the skies were all like, you know, matte, matte paintings of, 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 of night. Uh, but, but just like, uh, you continue on with the with 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 what you're doing, but but I think but but Jen talked a lot about spending time in Africa with no light pollution and 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 and, and his memory of what that looked like, and and that's what like our night scenes are attempting to 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 be. Um, but anyway, now yeah. continue. It, yeah, it's draft. If it's draft one of that, so there's some stuff I just wanted to try out. That I was curious about for a long time, which is you know you don't see. Uh, color at night, right? You go from, you know, cone vision to rod vision, you know, so, uh, which are cells in your eye that are more sensitive to light, but they don't see color. And furthermore, they don't see red light at all. So, you know, you see blue and you see some green and that's it. So how do you do that? Well, uh, I was shooting, I was shooting some tests for, for night, uh, just to get lighting ratios down, you know, for what I want and what, how much you want to see, um, fill light to key light ratios, blah, blah, blah. And just out of curiosity, I had the lighthouse filter with us, you know, and I was doing the usual thing. I was like, how much blue? And I did all these steps, like, you know, full blue, three quarter, one and a quarter, whatever. And I was like, just, add, just throw this on, just see what this looks like, you know. And I got the results back, and then all the nice stuff just looked like, you know, a movie. You make it dark enough, it starts looking good-ish. And then the lighthouse one popped up, you know, in the, in the color suite, and it looks ridiculous. Uh and I was like, well, just desaturate this. And I was desaturating the heck out of the other stuff, too, you know. But it's just something about you're only using this narrow wavelength, you know, the, this narrow band of wavelengths from, like, ultraviolet to beginning of green. And then when you desaturate that, it felt to me like stuff looks like, you know, it feels like night vision to me, what, what my eyes see subjectively. You know, if you take a picture of a night sky in a digital camera, it looks, you know, it, it looks different than it does to your eye because your eyes don't see all the different colors of the stars because of the light level. It just looks like white stars. Uh, digital photographs of the Milky Way, it's like all kinds of colors, you know, because these are two different phenomena. So it's its its not going after literally what would be there if you could photograph a night, but it, what your eyes see was, was the intention. And the other interesting thing was, was uh, seeing color in black and white at the same time in the same frame, you know, and I think brought this up a few times, but, you know, I, I know that I knew that I'd lose my color sensitivity after it got so dark, but one time I was on the slopes of Kilimanjaro, you know, the summer before we shot this movie and I saw some tents and, you know, it, it was like almost a full moon. So we had moonlight, which all looked silvery and black and white. And then at these tents, uh, the camp that we're all 
person with color, and I was seeing them at the same time. Like this tree in the foreground that was black and white, and someone's flashlight in the tent, you know, this orange tent or whatever, was popping. And I was like, I'm seeing two. So, how, you know, so I, I wanted to get almost like a, a science experiment. Like, how do you do that in a movie? You know, I just want to, I don't know if it's a good idea or not creatively, but I haven't seen that. Let's, you know, let's try it. So, um, yeah, there's a whole rigmarole I should write about and not speak about, uh, about how to, how to do that. And, but, um, well, you were saying that most of the Northman was night for night. You weren't doing a lot of day for night, right. but when you, when you just did, for control, you know, sure, well, cause uh, Ireland's going to be, you know, cloudy and it's just doesn't look good. I, I mean, I actually do. We did. I like. Or, did I did we shoot any day for night? I don't even know if we did. That the it's like some second unit stuff, like the the howling wide shot, you know, where you had a second. Like, no, we ended we up. So we little, ended like, up shooting that on stage. We sh- we shot it day for night. And, no, the and then the big the big tableau. Oh, the sure, giant sure. extreme long shot tableau. Okay. Other than that, that's pro- that's all that comes to mind. So there's you know? the so one just landscape a little shot. bit of day for night. One landscape yeah. shot, and that was like a that was like a, a second unit person. Yeah, and oh yeah, like, I suppose I suppose, like, there, there's other landscape shots. Like I mean, well, like the op- the opening shot of the volcano is is day for night. So so when, but I think any I think I think that we shot a couple things um, day for night with actors, and 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 they didn't really match it because we didn't have the hard the hard light, and so we, re- we ended up reshoot re- reshooting them. But you know, that's our farm. We're we're there for months. You know, and then, you know, so I think literally he found like a eight minute window of sun, you know, and he was already there, ready to shoot. Like, there it is, you know, and he ran. I, and I think, ran I think, the, I think if we had had more, over. if we had had more direct sunlight, like maybe some small beats with Alex, uh, we probably would have done day for night uh, just so we didn't have to bother with like the rigmarole of the lighting setups. Um, but we just didn't have that in, in, in Ireland, you know. But Rob's taste kind of dictate that you always shoot in a gloomy place, you know? So, I mean, if we're shooting in the California desert, you know, any pick any night, you know, you can plan a whole movie around, you know, shoot day for night, but that was not the case here. You, in, in all your films to date, including the Northman, probably even more so the Northman, you're, you're putting your actors through quite a challenge. Like you're, it, you know, a lot of elements are there. They have to deal with quite a bit. And there, we actually discussed quite uh, a lot on the lighthouse about the, you know, the, the work that the actors had to do, the challenges the actors had to overcome for the film. Were there similar types of situations on the Northman? Did you, did you feel like you were pushing your talent uh, maybe a little bit harder than they would normally be pushed? And if so, why? Um, <sighs> yeah, I, I mean, I think that the elements, uh, you know, being being outside in the cold, um, in bad weather all the all day long, uh, doing stunt work, repetitive stunt work, and being half naked is uh, tiring. Um, but I think you know, Alex was demanding like utter perfection of himself for this movie. So he was excited to do it. And I think also, you know, people do, did feel for the, for the most part, like they were part of something different, you know? So like the, it was, so the, the, the berserkers became like buddies, you know, and they were like excited to like, you know, uh, do this stuff and do this stuff together, you know? So I think, I think that, um, uh, you know, it it is like like I said, all all that stuff I just said is exhausting, but you know, it's worth it because you're doing something, uh, you know, you're, you're pushing yourselves. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fun in the end. And I assume by this point, your career, people kind of know, not necessarily know what to expect, not that each one's similar, but I think they there's a level of trust in your direction and the way that you're going to push them. So I, I feel like you probably have leeway now even more so because people, you, you have a track record. I would hope so. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but I mean, you know, Willem uh, like always spoke very fondly of the process of shooting the lighthouse 
But I also don't think that he would deny that sometimes he was like very frustrated with how Jared and I work, uh, but knew that it was worth it, you know. But then on the Northman, although he was only there for a couple of weeks, uh, he he knew what how, what it was like to work with us, and it and it was like and 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 I and he was like in a great mood the whole time because he kn- knew like what to expect. Although when he left, he was like he was like. Well, guys, it's been short, uh, but I can't say that I'm not glad to leave. Good luck, <laughs> you know, uh, to, to you know to the other cast members. So, um, but I think, uh, yeah, Jared, do you feel the same way? Is there something in that in that push to try to, you know, m- push these actors in maybe directions that they're not used to? Or, but, yeah, I think that's why you know Rob is so interested in. Uh, and I have him here to to confirm or deny. But I think that's why he's interested in sort of people coming back and having a family because, you know, they know what the deal is. You know, this is what we're doing. And, you know, the, the first time around they may not. And, this, you know, second time they definitely will. So, um, yeah, and I think Willem's a good example who was, you know, I think he had one, we had one overhead shot with the fire raging. And I think, Rob, you were in some conversation to figure something out. He's like, you know, it, it's hot. He's like naked. It's just like, you know, fire on his flesh, you know, and it, one one little moment but other than that like yeah the moment that we were yeah. setting him on fire <laughs> but <laughs> well, how dare he and well that's my i mean it's, it's partially my fault because like i want to shoot slow film and i you know the fires need to be unrealistically huge so you know but we actually have a question about the fires from fabricio diaz on instagram wants to know how you were planning and shooting the scenes with the bonfires and and, and specifically he was curious about how you're controlling the smoke how are you getting it so that it doesn't come towards crew and cloud the cloud the lens with such huge fires? The vast majority of fire isn't fire at all. So I, th- I think since the witch, there's this idea that I do everything natural light, but that's not the case at all. You know, I mean, the witch, yes, lighthouse, you know, because uh, we switched to film. So you know, and uh, the way we shoot, you know, the way I've chosen to expose these movies is you know uh, low ASA. So. Yeah. It's a, anyway, in this movie, it's it's a bunch of it's a rays of five hundred watt bolts, you know. And then and then, then we yeah. and then they photograph fire and plonk the fire. Yeah. Rob did not like them. Actually, the problem is not the bulbs; it's the gelling of the bulbs uh, that that makes it a little too big. So you got to have a certain amount of distance, and because the light levels are intense. I mean, we had a raise of you know one hundred eighty bulbs, two hundred forty bulbs, five hundred watts each. You know, for the Great Hall, for instance, or you know, in the woods, and it has to throw you know, a, a certain distance. Uh, and, so, and, and, uh, and then, and also, and when they were real fires, they were like, uh, gas fires or pro- propane fires. Yeah. So, I mean, it's almost, so, 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 so there, like, so there's not like, you know, like the, the, the wood tends to be dressing and, uh, and ceramic. So that's not very smoky. Yeah. I love that. Did, did you like the experience of working with so many visual effects this time around? Robert, um, I really love working with Angela Barson, our VFX uh, supervisor, and uh, and and it was it was it, I mean, there's more visual effects than I would like in the movie. Um, you know, uh, th- th- you know, we because of COVID, we couldn't shoot very much in Iceland. We had to shoot much less than we wanted, and we knew that there would be some level of like foreground mid-ground is Ireland, and the deep background, Iceland, fine. Uh, But there was a lot more of that than I wanted. And it's not sinful, and people do it all the time, but it's just, you know, and and it's also like a pain in the butt. So, for example, uh, when, uh, you know, Alex and Annie and the the enslaved people land on the beach in Iceland, that was in Ireland. We spent, like, so much time scouting for the most Icelandic looking beach we could find in, in Ireland. Uh, and then, uh, then they, we have plate shots of Iceland. So when we pan around from this kind of outcropping of land that looks kind of Icelandic, then we plucked Iceland in the back of the shot, you know, and, and then there is also work being done to uh, make the, the, the sand black, uh, with CG, 
you know, uh, you know, I think it works. I think it works quite well, but it was definitely like a whole lot. Sorry I, that my stuff isn't muted. I, I thought I did. Um, uh, that's a whole lot of work for something that we could have just shot in Iceland, but we couldn't, you know, because of, because of COVID stuff. Yeah. And then the black sand, you know, obviously reflects slightly different than light sand and, you know, you're dealing with, and, but thankfully it's not a sunny day because it's Ireland. So, um, that, yeah, so it's on the edge of working. <laughs> so, but I think I, like, yeah, you know, and I, 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 I enjoyed, uh, I, I feel like I know what I'm doing with visual effects now. I feel like some of the visual effects in the movie look great. Some of them look not as great. And I know why. You know, and and so I feel, um, and 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 by the way, like there, the, the fault is of me and Jaren, and I, like the VFX team oh, yeah. for the things that don't work. I just want to make that very clear. Uh, and but but now I feel like the the next movie, uh, like if we have more VFX, I I feel like excited and confident about um, doing them and, and making it look much more seamless. Yeah, for for me, I, I'm I I'm not a you know. You can be against them as a rule, but I think any time where they're making it more, uh, making it more realistic, like a night scene, you know, adding a night sky, you know, um, making it more like the real, I think that's, that's worth it to me. So last question, cause I know you guys only have a couple minutes left and we'll start with you, Jaron. What was the, what was probably the biggest takeaway? What was the biggest lesson learned on the Northman? Uh... I have, that's impossible to label, but I, 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 all I can say is that I feel like if you split my knowledge in half, half of it was everything up to the Northman and then everything was, the other half was Northman for sure. Really? It was that, <laughs> that dramatic of a change in your career? Yeah, a lot of it's just, like, just fundamental photographic knowledge. I mean, when I shot the lighthouse, I took, a, it was like after a, a break from film for eight years you know what I mean? So I just had like, I just did what you do digitally, which is like, Oh, I'm just going to put a lamp on the table. Okay. You know? And then later in the shoot, I'd sort of polish it a bit cause I knew what it needed. It needs more fill light than I'm used to blah, blah, blah. But this was, yeah. Like just down to lighting ratios, spectrum of color, you know, the fundamentals. But that's kind and, of a lot of it. And same question for you, Robert. I mean, do, was there one, you know, major takeaway that you have from filming the Northman? Um, I think it's just, you know, for, for me, uh, <clears throat> uh, to, you know, just no matter what, uh, you gotta be yourself. I, I know that that's like st stupid, but, um, but I think, uh, there was a lot of times when there was pressure to like, um, because of just the challenges of, of all this stuff to, to like, do something in an easier way or, or compromise in, in, a, in a way that, you know, would have just made things a lot easier. And, uh, and, and, you know, I, and, and when I stuck to my guns, so to speak, uh, it still worked out. So, um, I mean, I, but I also like kind of like Jaren's answer is also really my answer. Like I, I'm trying to think of something to say, but, <laughs> but you know, uh, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Well, the film is available on demand right now. You guys can find it, you know, wherever you find your movies, but go see it, go buy it if you haven't already. And Robert, Jaron, honestly, like, I really, really appreciate you coming back and uh, already kind of getting excited for your next appearance on the show. So promise us right now that you'll come back for your next film because we want you oh, back. We will. Yeah, certainly. All right. Thanks, guys. It's pleasure. All right. I want to thank Robert Eggers and Jaron Blaschke for coming back on the show to talk about The Northman, which I absolutely loved, loved, loved. So I hope you guys love the movie and I hope you love this conversation. Please let us know. Head over to our social media or our website or our YouTube and let us know what you think of the episode. I also want to thank Connor Crosby for producing the show. You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com and Dave Siegel at siegelsound.com for mixing and mastering and making it sound so good. And of course, I want to thank our sponsor, Shotlister. Shotlister is a shot list creation app for productions. It is the best in the business. And if you aren't using it right now, stop everything, go check it out and start using it. It's amazing. And we thank those guys for their support. Shotlister.com. 
Of course, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, where we post exclusive content, show shorts, and mix in some behind the scenes during our interviews. So it's really a great way to experience the Go Creative Show interviews. All things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com. And if you want to follow me, you can find me at Ben Consoli on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you for joining us today, and we will see you next week on another episode of the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers.